and welcome to the latest episode of the Green Left News Podcast. I'm your host, Isaac Nellis, and I'm joined by Green Left journalist, Leo Earle. We'll be taking you through the latest activist news from Australia and around the world. Green Left is a people-powered media project that has been running for more than 30 years. We center the voices of activists and provide an alternative to the corporate news media. You can become a supporter today for only $5 a month at greenleft.org.au forward slash support. Before we begin, we acknowledge that this podcast is recorded on stolen Gadigal Wangal land that has never been ceded and always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Green Left is committed to supporting struggles for First Nations justice. Labor has broken its election promise to scrap cashless welfare, passing legislation to introduce the new Inju smart card on June 22. The smart card is essentially the same as the previous cashless debit card, which had been critiqued as a paternal, racist and cruel program. The Social Security Administration Amendment 6 Income Management Reform Bill was supported by the Coalition and One Nation and allows the Social Security Minister to expand cashless welfare across the country. While Labor is claiming the new card is voluntary, it does not allow individuals to opt out, and the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights report on the bill said it's capable of subjecting an individual to mandatory income management. Campaigners are angry and disappointed with Labor's decision to reintroduce cashless welfare and have pointed out that it is happy to break its promise on this issue, but is still leaning on its pre-election promise not to scrap the Stage 3 tax cuts for the rich. The family of a man shot dead by New South Wales Police in 2019 have made an emotional plea for change on the final day of the coronial inquest into his death. Todd McKenzie was suffering from a severe psychotic episode when police arrived at his home in Taree and began a nine-hour long siege. At 9.50pm, police broke into his home and shot Todd three times in the back. The inquest found that New South Wales Police Special Ops Force ordered local police to turn off their body cameras and police taunted Todd during his mental health crisis. They also declined family offers to negotiate with Todd and did not consult with psychiatrists during the siege. National Justice Project statistics show that half of those shot dead by New South Wales police in the past 20 years have suffered from mental health issues. Todd's mother, June Wilkins, and stepfather, Neil Wilkins, told the court they are tormented by the thought that their son's death could have been avoided. Hundreds marched through Gaddy or Sydney chanting trans rights are human rights on June 25. The protest was organised by the Rainbow Rights Coalition and featured drag performances by Cassandra the Queen and King Woody, as well as powerful speeches from LGBTIQ activists, unionists and councillors. The rally stopped at Pitt Street Uniting Church to hear from Minister Jo Ingpen, a trans woman. A variety of groups supported the protest and organiser Rachel Evans told Green Left she had been threatened by right-wing bigots in the lead-up to the rally. You can watch the drag performances on Green Left social media and a Rainbow Rights roundtable is being held on July 16 at the University of Sydney to discuss the next steps in the campaign for trans and queer rights. World Whistleblower Day was marked on June 23 outside South Australian Parliament House in Tardania, or Adelaide. More than 150 people attended the gathering, which heard from several speakers, including whistleblower David McBride and John Shipton, the father of Julian Assange, who called for his immediate release from Britain's Belmarsh prison. Also on World Whistleblower Day, an anti-nuclear submarine forum organised by the No AUKUS Coalition Victoria drew up to 200 people. Speakers included Peter Garrett, the former Environment Minister and lead singer of Midnight Oil, Dr Margaret Beavis, who's a co-chair of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons Australia, and Australian Metal Workers Union Victorian Secretary Tony Mavramatis, and Arthur Roras, who's the Secretary of the South Coast Labor Council and part of the Community Campaign Against a Nuclear Submarine Base in Port Kembla, New South Wales. National protests against August have been planned for Hiroshima Day on August 6th. The community campaign to protect libraries and vital services in Geelong from cuts is growing, with pressure mounting on the City of Greater Geelong Council and more than 120 people rallying outside the Geelong West Town Hall on June 24, showing their opposition to the cuts. The rally heard from Australian Services Union member Adele Welsh, ASU Secretary Lisa Damanin, Save the Geelong West Library activist Angela Carr and Sarah Hathaway from Socialist Alliance. 
At the time of the rally, Hathaway was set to become the new councillor for Windermere Ward after the resignation of councillor Kylie Grisbeck in May, and she has now been confirmed as the new councillor, the fifth socialist councillor in Victoria, in a great win for the left. Hathaway was elected after a council countback, but the Victorian Electoral Commission did not undertake the countback until the crucial budget vote had already taken place the day before. Hathaway told Green Left she's looking forward to working with the community in the northern suburbs, particularly Norlane and Carayo, which are two of the most disadvantaged in Victoria. She promised to hold monthly meetings with the ward to listen to residents' concerns and to improve the council's community engagement. A team of activists is challenging for positions in the Communication Workers' Union. Organiser Anthony Beale told Green Left Radio how the CWU leadership had failed to take up the fight over pay and conditions. During COVID-19, postal workers were made to double their delivery rounds and 50% of workers were laid off. In addition, postal workers were not asked to participate in decision-making over a new memorandum of understanding that drastically altered working conditions for the worse. Veal explained how the group's push for more union activism came from the informal pissed off posties get united now group the activist ticket has faced difficulties because it doesn't have the resources of the leadership but they have found success in organizing workers and addressing union members real concerns the ballot closed on june 30 and results will be announced in the coming days the legalized cannabis party who now have representatives in the upper house in new south wales victoria and wa has simultaneously issued the drug misuse and trafficking amendment Regulation of Personal Adult Use of Cannabis Bill across the three state parliaments on June 20. The bill seeks to amend the 1985 Drug Misuse and Tracking Act to make it legal for adults to possess, cultivate and share small quantities of cannabis for personal use. It is modelled on ACT laws which came into effect in 2020. And the ACT is the only jurisdiction where cannabis is legal for personal use, although it's still illegal to sell it, expose it to children or grow it hydroponically. Medical cannabis has become accessible in Australia, but is still difficult to access and expensive. It's not listed on the pharmaceutical benefits scheme. If the current trilogy of legalised cannabis bills succeed, they will make legal history and benefit a lot of very sick people. A group of public housing residents, political parties and community groups held a vigil on July 3rd at the Barrack Beacon Public Housing Estate in Port Melbourne to stop the demolition of the 40-year-old estate. The organisers are demanding that Daniel Andrews' Labor government commit to the repair, retain, reinvest proposal that residents have produced. Margaret Kelly, the last remaining tenant, has been contesting her eviction in the Victorian Civil and Administrative Tribunal, and the government has used this opportunity to begin demolition of parts of the estate. Victorian Greens leader Samantha Ratnam pointed to the occupation of the 82 Wentworth Park site in Glebe, Sydney as an inspiration and affirmed the need for a grassroots campaign to save the site. Yeah, the um, Save Barrack Beacon campaign is a really crucial one, particularly in the midst of this ongoing housing crisis. And I was lucky to attend the Housing as a Human Rights session, which was part of uh, Eco Socialism 2023, a World Beyond Capitalism conference that Green Left organised over the weekend of July 1st and 2nd. And that session heard from, from Margaret Kelly and other housing activists from NAM and Sydney as well as loads of other incredible sessions. So some of the highlights included keynote, keynote speaker Kohei Saito's session on degrowth communism, the session on the fight for democracy in India, Is Modi Fascist, featuring Indian um, communist Clifton de Rosario and climate campaigner Rachira Talukdar. And there were also great sessions on First Nations justice and sovereignty with Lydia Thorpe, Climate Justice and the Global South with Malaysian socialist Chong Hui Ting and Pakistani socialist Farooq Tariq. Yeah, it was an incredible conference with great international and local guests at a really amazing uh, venue down there, the Trades Hall. Some of the sessions are already available to watch on the Green Left YouTube channel and more will be uploaded over the coming days. We highly recommend checking out the recorded sessions online at youtube.com slash greenleftonline slash streams. And now let's hear what's happening around the world. Pacific communities are protesting the Japanese government's plan to dump more than 1 million tonnes of radioactive waste water from the Fukushima nuclear plant into the Pacific Ocean. While the power station operator, Tokyo Electric Power Company, 
or TEPCO, claims the water will be treated to reduce radioactive content, anti-nuclear activists have no faith in these assurances. The Sydney-based Korean community group Candlelight Alliance spokesperson Si Yun Pak told Green Left that there are serious global ramifications for the dumping, including directly endangering marine life, people whose livelihoods rely on marine life, and even beachgoers. Scientists say the contamination will reach all ocean waters within two to three years. Epoli Lazume from the Fiji-based Pacific Network on Globalization told Green Left that, for Pacific people, the ocean represents more than just a vast blue expanse that Japan can use as a dump site. He said, our oceans represent the economic, spiritual, and cultural heart of Pacific communities. That's, this is a particularly shocking story to yeah. imagine that suddenly all these islands with um, communities really sort of dependent on them for recreation and just livelihoods are suddenly going to have yeah, radioactive water. It's, 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 you couldn't make it up in a science fiction yeah, it's it's really crazy, and um, all power to the communities and activists who are protesting against um, this plan to dump nuclear waste in the ocean. It just sounds insane to even talk about it. Um, speaking of insane, over in Russia, the war in Ukraine took a stunning turn on June 23rd when thousands of troops belonging to the Wagner Private Military Company, which is a mercenary force linked to the Russian regime, crossed back over the border from where it had been fighting Ukrainian forces and started more marching towards Moscow. And uh, Wagner chief Yevgeny Prigozhin, who was formerly a close ally of Vladimir Putin, said he was taking action against the Russian Defense Ministry's handling of the war. And the next day, Putin had denounced the move as an armed uprising and vowed to punish those involved. Yet almost as quickly as it was begun, a deal was struck on June 24, in which all charges against the rebellion were dropped in exchange for Wagner troops returning to Ukraine. Green Left's Federico Fuentes spoke to Russian leftist Alexander Zamatin about the situation, and he said mutiny had been a ticking time bomb, with the Wagner group gaining power and influence over the past few decades, supported by Putin, but the Kremlin becoming increasingly concerned by Prigozhin's rise. He said the conflict was resolved quickly because both sides realised their positions were weak, and Zamatin said this situation has left Putin incredibly weakened, but emphasised that both forces, Putin and the Wagner Group, represent an extreme evil for Russia, and the majority of people uh, and progressive anti-war people should not emphasise with either side. Read the full interview at greenleft.org.au. On the topic of authoritarian leaders, Indian Prime Minister Nahendra Modi continued his shoulder rubbing with Western leaders in a surprise visit to the United States to meet President Joe Biden. Modi who has presided over a steady decline in press freedom in India, has never held a solo news conference, but attended one with Biden, where each answered two questions, on climate change and on human rights concerns. Modi took full advantage of the meeting to strengthen India's standing without conceding to Biden's foreign policy goals. Modi falsely claimed that India is a democracy that does not discriminate against ethnic or caste minorities, despite the mountains of evidence that his administration does so. The meeting follows Modi's Recent visit to Australia, where Anthony Albanese called him the boss and continues the trend of Western countries trying to get Modi on side in the war drive against China. Uh, and so a bit of a plug here for a book that's just come out by Anthony Lowenstein called The Palestinian Laboratory, which shows the strong ties that ethno-nationalist states around the world have to Israel. Uh, Israel tests their uh, advanced military technology on Palestinians and then exports this around the world. And so it's a case of ethno-national fascism propping each other up around the world. Yeah, I'm definitely seeing that with um, how uh, Modi is suddenly besties with Albanese and Biden and and others. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, Eco-Socialism 2023, the conference featured some great panels and discussions about Modi's India. Um, and the one on uh, whether Modi is fascist with Clifton de Rosario is currently available to watch online. On June 20, Turkey carried out a targeted assassination of political leaders in the Autonomous Administration of North and East Syria, also known as Rojava. This brings the number of people killed by Turkish drones in Rojava this year to 48, and a further 38 have been wounded. 
13 of those killed were civilians and none were a threat to Turkey. Civilian leaders have been specifically targeted, including female co-chair of the Kamishalo Canton Council, Yushra Devis, and deputy co-chair Lima Sivas. The two women are both Kurdish, and there was little international reaction, with the United States only issuing a pathetic statement calling on both parties to de-escalate. Turkey has been carrying out drone assassinations since June 2020, accompanied by constant bombardments, and Turkey wants to destroy the autonomous administration by destabilizing their society and driving the local population away, and Turkey is also supporting ISIS in its attacks against Rojava. In Senegal, at least 16 people have been killed, hundreds injured, and more than 500 arrested following three days of protest in early June. The protests were in response to the conviction and sentencing of popular opposition figure Osmane Sonko on charges of immoral behaviour towards a person younger than 21, a charge he and his supporters say was politically motivated. If the conviction is upheld, it will derail his campaign in next year's presidential election. Sonko rose to popularity in 2015 after revealing documents exposing corruption in the government and questioning Senegal's relationship with its former colonizer France. France's colonization devastated Senegal, and its impact continues today with the CFA franc currency being used as a tool of colonial oppression. The massage parlor employee who accused Sonko of rape has become the target of a vilification campaign, and women's rights activists are concerned that this would prejudice the trial and prevent victims of sexual abuse coming forward. A government crackdown on Sonko supporters, which includes arrests and social media restrictions, has been condemned by rights groups. And as the housing crisis continues in Australia, it's worth looking overseas to see what's being done elsewhere to ensure that people are housed. And a record 4 million homes were delivered to Venezuelan citizens in April last year as part of a social housing program called the Great Housing Mission of Venezuela. The Bolivarian government has aimed to build 500,000 homes for the disadvantaged by the end of last year as part of a public policy to deliver 5 million low-cost homes for working people by 2024. It's one of a series of social missions, including around education, health, and social welfare, that were established by the Bolivarian Revolution that was commenced in 1999 under President Hugo Chavez. There's a stark contrast between this ambitious 5 million homes commitment and the Labor government in Australia's plan to only build 30,000 homes over five years. Fighting between the rival military factions of the Sudanese Armed Forces and the Rapid Support Forces Militia has been ongoing since April 15, killing more than 3,000 people and displacing millions. Green Left spoke to Mason El Nagumi, a member of the Sudanese community in Western Sydney, about the grassroots responses to the crisis. She said there had been no ceasefire despite announcements there would be some. She said they are being used as propaganda. She explained how local neighbourhoods are organising on the ground, including setting up medical clinics in response to the bombing of hospitals. Makeshift pharmacies and community kitchens have been set up in schools. Very little international aid is making it to the communities. People are using social media to spread information about safe evacuation routes, medical info, and grassroots organising. Yeah, you can read the full interview with Maysoon El Nagumi, as well as all of the other stories we've talked about today at greenleft.org.au. Rallies are being held around the country to mark 10 years since offshore processing of refugees began under the Kevin Rudd government. Refugees are calling for permanent protection and an end to temporary visas. There are protests in Gimoy or Cairns on July 19 at the Western Lawn Esplanade, July 22 in Nam at the State Library, July 23 in Gaddy at Sydney Town Hall, July 23 in Mianjin or Brisbane at King George Square, and in Anganawal or Canberra on July 23rd at the intersection of Northbourne Avenue and London Circuit. Find more details at greenleft.org.au slash events. Greenleft needs your support to continue. You can become a supporter for only $5 a month and donate to our 2023 fighting fund to help us make more content like this. Go to greenleft.org.au slash support to help us out. And remember to follow Greenleft on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok for the latest news and analysis. Thanks for listening. 